evening and welcome Flower Mound United Methodist Church. It's so good to be with you today in our worship service. Even though we are virtual, we know that the Spirit of God unites us and connects us. And so thankful for those of you who are watching. Please let us know that you are here. Check in, give us a thumbs up because we want to let you know how much we appreciate your presence. We are gathered together for our our traditional service at 11 o'clock, uh, remembering the presence of God who is alive and well with us as we celebrate the resurrection. We continue to be Easter people, and so we begin now a series of Eastertide in which we um, celebrate certainty even in these uncertain times. And so let us join you to respond. We come to worship the risen Lord. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We celebrate today that nothing can stop God's love. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Even in this time of uncertainty, we can be sure of this. Christ is risen. Alleluia. So Easter people, raise your voices and sing that Christ is risen, alleluia. Let us sing, Easter people, raise your voices. The Apostles' Creed unites us with the people of faith who have gone before us. It reminds us of the truth of our faith throughout time, that God is alive and well, has been and will continue to be. And so in that assurance, with our foremothers and forefathers of the faith, let us recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
At this time, I would like to invite the children in the congregation to come forward. Just gather around your TV or your tablet or wherever you may be watching. And as you do so, I want to invite your family to print out your worship bulletin that was sent out earlier this week uh, so that you might color and draw along listening to the sounds of worship alongside your family. And now as you gather, I want to share with you our story for today. It's from the book of John in the Bible. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the very beginning of the New Testament. John is the fourth book of the Bible, and this story happens after Easter. It's after the day that Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus is alive, and the disciples are hearing these stories from the various people who have seen him. But they're having trouble believing what's going on, and they're quite afraid. And in fact, they're so afraid that they've all huddled together in one room. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, this sounds kind of familiar, all huddling together with people that you know in one room. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of that lately and maybe even feeling a little bit afraid of what you're hearing is going on outside. You know, my daughter um, has been asking me questions about why it is that people are wearing masks outside, even when we go on a walk or as she's seeing in the grocery store. And she's been seeing people wearing masks. And in fact, we decided to make a mask because one of the things that you have to understand about wearing a mask is that the person is still underneath it. Look. See? You can still see my eyes smiling, right? I'm still underneath. These masks don't have to be a scary thing. In fact, they're used to protect us, to protect us from the germs of the virus. And so one of the things that I hope you will remember is that in our story today, Jesus recognizes that the disciples are feeling afraid. And we can remember that Jesus recognizes when you're feeling afraid too. In fact, he recognized it so well that he came into the room and he talked to the disciples and he said these words, peace be with you, peace be with you. And then he breathed on them and they felt assured that Jesus was with them and was alive and well. And so I'm going to ask you today to do this with me, to take a deep breath and remember these words, peace be with you. Can you do that with me? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And so whenever you're feeling just like the disciples, a little bit nervous or maybe even afraid about what's going on outside, remember those words and take a deep breath. And remember, Jesus is with you right there, listening to all of your worries and concerns and breathing peace upon you. Can we say a prayer together? Let's pray. And you can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the Easter story and for being with us when we feel afraid. Help us to remember your peace is always with us. Amen. And now you may have noticed that Pastor Taylor is not here. Um, he and his wife, Katie, are expecting their baby any minute now. And so he wanted to um, offer a sermon today, which has been pre-recorded right there in their nursery. And so I invite you to listen to the word as brought to us from Pastor Taylor on the story of Thomas. 
Well, good morning, Flower Mound United Methodist Church. It's such a joy and an honor and a privilege to be with you this Sunday. Uh, there's a good chance that this might be my last Sunday for just a for just a little while, as my wife is uh, preparing to welcome our son into the world uh, any day now. As a matter of fact, uh, you are I'm tuning in from my son's nursery room. Um, remotely so as to practice uh, social distancing and be sure that myself and my wife are uh, safe and healthy before we go into labor and delivery. Um, all that being said, we are starting a new sermon series called, Uncer uh, called Certainty in Uncertain Times, where, we'll, where we will be looking at some of the post-resurrection scenes, uh, knowing and trusting that the resurrection is something that we can put our whole trust and faith in. And so today we'll be looking at the familiar passage of Doubting Thomas. That passage can be found in uh, the Gospel of John chapter 20. I'm going to read it in a little bit. I want to kind of introduce the passage first. So while we get started, I invite you to find a Bible and go ahead and open to John chapter 20, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, let's go ahead and say a quick prayer. Almighty God, we invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Uh, we invite you to span time and space and to connect everyone who is hearing and receiving this word today together. Uh, God, let me move out of the way. Let this uh, message not be me, but let me just be a vehicle for people to hear you. We pray all this in your son's precious name through the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's children said, amen, amen. So I was at a pastor's conference slash uh, retreat slash training a couple, about, about two and a half years ago now. And when I got there, there was about 40 or 50 clergy from different sized churches, small to large, different uh, lengths of pastorates, everything from a year freshly ordained to a year away from retirement. And when we got there, uh, they split everyone into these table groups of about five to seven folks. And they invited everyone to participate in an icebreaker so that we could get to know uh, one another. And I have to admit, I was a little embarrassed at first when we started this icebreaker um, because they handed everyone in the room a piece of paper, a pen or a pencil, and they said, okay, we want to see, pop quiz, we want to see who can name all 12 disciples the fastest on your mark, get set, go. And so I was embarrassed, of course, because as soon as I started writing, I knew immediately, I just don't know. the. I know I've learned them at some point in my life, but I have since forgotten the name of all 12. And then uh, my embarrassment subsided a little bit when what felt like eternity, but reality was only probably two or three minutes. I looked around and noticed that no one else in the room had uh, had written or had, you know, won this pop quiz. Um, so... Uh, at this point, if we were all meeting in person, if we were in the sanctuary, I might invite you to raise your hand and ask the question, how many of you can name all 12? And if any of you were brave enough to hold your hand up, I might call on you uh, just to be ornery and see if you could, no, I wouldn't, I would never put you on the spot like that. Uh, so we are tasked with naming all 12 and just so you know, by way of teaching, you can find the list um, of all 12 of the disciples in Matthew chapter 10 in Mark chapter 3, and then also in Luke chapter 6. And so as we started looking at these passages, I learned something uh, that I didn't, I guess I'd never realized before, that the disciples were usually pairs of brother who were related to one another. So you've got Peter and Andrew, they were brothers. James and John, they were brothers. Thaddeus and Simon, they're thought to believe, bro believe to be brothers. Matthew and James, and interesting, this James is called James the Lesser. Um, I don't really know how I would feel about being called the Lesser. Um, I guess if you want to call me Taylor the Lesser, I would just insist that you call me Reverend Taylor the Lesser at the very least. Um, then you've got Philip. You've got Bartholomew, or sometimes called Nathaniel. You've got Thomas. And then, of course, last is Judas. So we were then asked to write down what we knew about the disciples and about their personality. And interestingly enough, uh, in the Gospels, there's actually very, very little written about their personality, uh, about their personality, about their character. The one disciple that we actually know the most about is Peter. Uh, so Peter is, he's the one who's always eager to jump up. He's the one who's always talking. Uh, we know a lot about 
Peter. But beyond that, we know a little bit about John, only because it's believed by most scholars that John goes on to write the Gospel of John, as well as those letters 1, 2, and 3 John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then we also get him again in Revelation. Another interesting fact or teaching point is that uh, he was the only disciple, John was the only disciple who is believed to have died of a natural death. All the other disciples are executed, um, but John dies of old age on the island of Patmos from where he writes the book of Revelation. Um, we know a little bit about Matthew, mainly that his former career was as a tax collector. Uh, we know a little bit about Judas, of course, because Judas is known for betraying Jesus. And then we know, of course, Thomas. And Thomas is infamous because he's been given the name Doubting Thomas. So all these clergy that are in this room, we were then asked to rank the disciples by order of their faithfulness. And here's the amazing thing. Whenever you read the list of disciples in Matthew 10, Mark 3, or Luke 6, uh, those gospel writers always start the list with the same disciple and they end the list with the same disciple. And so it starts the same and it ends the same. And who would you think starts the list? Peter. It's always Peter who is the first disciple listed. And then who would you expect ends the list? Well, it's Judas. So Peter's always ranked the highest and Judas is typically ranked the lowest. But what else is amazing is that usually in this listing, uh, just before Judas, Thomas comes down at the end as well. And so in terms of faithfulness, Thomas is not known for being a Peter. And he's not known for even being a John or a James or a Matthew. In fact, he is only slightly greater than Judas. And we give him little credit because he didn't go as far as to betray Jesus, but instead he's received the name Doubting Thomas because he's thought to have doubted the resurrection. And so as part of this icebreaker, we go on and we were asked then after uh, writing them all down and trying to describe their characteristics, we were asked to identify which disciple we most saw ourselves in. And it shouldn't surprise you that in a room full of preachers and pastors, uh, people who are known for being Enneagram 3s, uh, if you do any Enneagram work, if not, just know that Enneagram 3s have a propensity for the theatrical, I mean, as an aside, you have to be somewhat narcissistic to stand up on stage each week and preach to people. Um, all joking aside, so most everyone aligned themselves with Peter. I mean, Peter was bold. He was courageous. He never had a thought that he didn't share. Peter was saved but not delivered from everything. Uh, in Mark chapter 4, the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, uh, when Jesus asks all the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter is the only one that confesses correctly, well, you're Christ, you're the Messiah. And so we see Peter getting it right. And then yet we see like in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter had a knife on him. I mean, he's literally like hanging out with the disciples, followers of Jesus. And yet for some reason, he feels compelled to arm himself. To the point that when people come to arrest Jesus, Peter takes the knife out and cuts a man's ear off. Peter fell and he got right back up again. He denies Jesus three times and he still got up and rises to be the leader of the early Christian movement. And so Peter is a reminder to us that our failures do not control our identity or our destiny. So a lot of the people in the room said, we identify with Peter. Now, as I was sitting there and it came around to my turn to share at our table, I said, I saw myself in Matthew. Matthew was the tax collector. He was a sinner if there ever was one. And yet he was reformed. He was changed. He was making the best out of a new situation. And so I chose Matthew because I felt like Matthew, uh, being a guy who worked in finances, would be a fun dude to grab a beer with, to just kind of shoot the breeze and uh, talk about like smart investment options. I don't know. It seemed like a good idea. But that was a couple years ago. And so if you ask me today... Who, which disciple do you see yourself in? I think my answer would have to be Thomas. You know, Thomas gets a bad rap. 
We rank him slightly above Judas. He does one thing in one passage of scripture that lasts three verses, and it gives him a name that follows him for thousands of years. I mean, what a shame to make a minor mistake and for that mistake to label you for the rest of your life. Thomas gets the name Doubting Thomas because of what happens in John chapter 20. And so if you'll grab your Bible, I want us to read together John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. Hear now the good news. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later... His disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in case you weren't paying too much attention to the reading, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He shows himself to the apostles in the upper room. Well, at least most of them are there. One is missing. It's Thomas. So when Jesus shows himself, Thomas, the disciple, does not see it. So the other disciples leave the upper room. They go and they find Thomas and they say, listen, we've just seen Jesus and he is alive. And the next week they're back in the upper, uh, and Thomas's response is, well, I've got to see it for myself. So the next week they're back in the upper room and Jesus shows up again and allows Thomas to touch the holes in his hands and the wound in his side. And when Thomas sees and touches Jesus, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus responds to Thomas saying, you are blessed because you have seen, but even more so will be those who have not seen and yet still believe. And it's because of that one moment that Thomas gets the name Doubting for the rest of eternity. But I want to suggest to you that Thomas represents something much deeper than someone with doubts. I want to suggest to you that Thomas represents something that lies within each and every one of us in this, at some moment in this spiritual journey we call life. And so I want to paint another picture of Thomas. One thing that we do know about Thomas from scripture is that Thomas is a disciple. There is no doubting that, there is no arguing that, there is no denying it. This much is for sure, he is a follower of Jesus. He has followed Jesus from the time that Jesus called him, and at no place in scripture does he ever deny Jesus. At no point in scripture does he ever betray Jesus. He doesn't even argue with the other disciples or Jesus like Remember John and James, the two brothers, they argue at one point uh, who is the greatest and who will get to sit next to Jesus on his right hand in eternal life. And, you know, like we don't even we don't ever even see Thomas throw up his hands and say, I quit. I'm done. This is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. Thomas, without a shadow or a question of doubt, is a certified follower of Jesus. 
So when the other disciples come to Jesus and they tell him that Jesus has risen, I don't think that, G that Thomas doubts that the Lord has risen. I don't think that he even doubts that it's possible. He doesn't deny that Jesus has risen. All he says is, I need to see it for myself. He makes room for the possibility of the resurrection. He just needs to experience it in a different way. It's like he's saying it's not, it's not the resurrection that Thomas doubts, but Thomas doubts the report of the disciples about the resurrection. This is important, so let me say that again. Thomas does not doubt that Jesus could have arisen from the dead. He just doesn't believe the report from the other disciples. So what Thomas's issue is, is he doesn't believe what the other disciples say he ought to believe. He's a believer in Christ, but he doesn't believe what the other disciples, disciples told him he should believe. Let me say it one more time. I believe in the Lord. I follow the Lord. I am a disciple of the Lord. But I don't always believe the same thing other believers say I ought to believe. So I want to suggest that Thomas, more than a doubter, represents the disciple who doesn't always agree with what other folks think he ought to believe. It's like he hears what the other people are saying and teaching and proclaiming and preaching, and he just says, but that doesn't quite sit right with me. So I think Thomas represents that space where we find ourselves in disagreement with some of the other things that other disciples and other Christians are saying, and we won't relinquish our position. And so I want to ask you, have you ever found yourself in a church where you heard something preached or taught, maybe from the pulpit or in a Sunday school class, and you thought, hmm. Have you ever heard a church push a theology, and it just didn't, it doesn't resonate with the God of grace and mercy and love that you have come to know in your own life? Have you ever found yourself evolving in your thinking about who God is and what God is all about? I mean, with all due respect, shame on you or shame on me if our theology is not, if, our, if the theology that we have received in second grade is not the same as today. As we grow and walk with God, there's something about walking with God that changes what our grandparents taught us and, and what our parents taught us and what our Sunday school teachers taught us and yes, even what I might be teaching you today. You can have experiences with God that make you say, hmm, that's not quite right with me. But they call us to reflect on other experiences we've had as well. And so I think Thomas grants us the space to disagree with other disciples. And here's the beautiful thing. Jesus never calls him doubting Thomas. Nowhere in all of scripture is Thomas called doubting Thomas. You want to know who called him doubting Thomas? It was the church that came afterward and looked back at him and said, he didn't believe everything we think he ought to believe, and so we're going to give him a negative label. And that's a label from people who rejected Thomas because he rejected what they were teaching. And so here's the point in all of this. I don't think we always have to believe everything everybody else believes in order to prove that we are a disciple. In fact, faith is not the same thing as belief in an idea. Faith is actionable. It's like taking a step and trusting that your feet will land on something solid. Faith is being transformed and reformed by the very creative energy that mysteriously we come to find is the same energy working transformation within us. The more you are transformed, the more you become aware of this in your life. And so Jesus says, I can still be a disciple even if I disagree with you or someone else. After all, Jesus doesn't call him Downing Thomas. He calls him blessed. He calls him by his name. 
I think one of the greatest problems with Christianity today is this fake and this false teaching that we're always going to say, always going to think the same about everything. And then if we don't, that we're okay to just label people. We label those who don't disagree with our own thinking or our own theology. But Jesus never called him Doubting Thomas. He simply called him by his name. So there are areas of grave disagreement in the body of Christ. We would be fools to deny it. In fact, I mean, it seems insane that it was only a month and a half ago that the United Methodist Church was at the point of complete and total division and separation. And yet the moment life gets real, we put those things aside. Because we realize that they don't affect our faith as much as we thought. And this is the power and the beauty of the resurrection. The resurrection reveals what is real. It exposes the truth, and not the truth of what's right or wrong for us to place a belief in, but deep truths, universal truths about what God is about and who God is. And so we're not called as Christians to prove the resurrection. Rather, I believe that we are called to see how Christ's resurrection draws out what is true and steadfast, what is solid and foundational, what is important and therefore what is real. Thomas represents the disciple that encourages us to make room for people to think differently about God than you or I might think. Thomas represents the disciple who encourages us to have experiences of God that are different than those that we've always had. And in this way, I believe Thomas represents the disciple whom embraces the endless conditions of possibility that the resurrection exposes. If this is what they meant when they called him Doubting Thomas, may we all doubt a little more. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Taylor, for that beautiful message. What an assurance it is to be reminded that God, Jesus calls Thomas by name as a faithful disciple, and as such, Jesus calls each and every one of us by name as well, knowing our hopes, our dreams, our fears. And in that assurance, we can go to God in prayer. And so it is that at this time, I would like to invite you to submit your prayer requests online on our Facebook Live page that we might pray for them after we hear this song, The Assurance of Christ's Redeeming, Jesus, Our Redeemer.
As we invite you all into a time of prayer, I invite you to give thanks to the Lord for the birth of Claire Marie Dunlap. The rose on our altar this morning is in her honor, born on the 16th of April, five pounds, three ounces, mom and baby and dad are doing just great. And so let us give thanks to God for that joyful birth. We also want to lift up for healing prayer um, for Andrew Sechrist, who is not with us today, our organist. He is not feeling well, and so we hope for a speedy recovery of him. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, who knows us by name, we are your disciples, and there is no denying this. We are so thankful for your grace to guide us in these uncertain times. Sometimes we need to see resurrection. Sometimes it's hard to find it in what is going on in these uncertain times, but we trust you. We trust you will give us the wisdom and the guidance and the grace to look for it to find it with your help. May you give us grace with one another as well, that even in the midst of our different beliefs or understandings of your presence with us, that we might respect one another as you respect us. And so it is that we come to you knowing that you care so deeply about each and every one of us that we offer these prayers to you. And concerns for Andrew Seacrest and Henry Varner for their health. We pray also for all of those who are struggling today, for the small businesses and the large businesses, for the musicians and the restaurants and the retail workers, for the airline pilots, for doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals who are doing so diligently the faithful work of caring for others. We pray for all of those who are struggling with mental health concerns, with anxiety, depression, addictions, that in this time of social distancing that they do not feel isolated and have persons around them to assure them of your holy presence. We pray for all of those um, students and educators who are grieving what is not, those high school seniors who are missing so many of the last times, that you will be with them to give them peace and to help them in virtual connections, to feel the presence and the grace of you and one another. We pray for a smooth delivery for um, niece Whitney this week, as well as for Katie and for Taylor. And we pray for Abby Taylor in the midst of her health concerns as well. God, we know that you are present in our every moment. Let us be certain of this and proclaim that certainty as the promise of your truth of resurrection, a truth that is absolute, a truth that is certain, the truth that you are a God who is with us, offering us new life every day. May we profess that faith as we profess our faith in the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in our time of offering ourselves this morning, I want to give thanks for the ministry that is continuing on despite this time of social distancing 
for our commitment to the homeless and those impoverished remains strong. And so we give thanks today for the homeless ministry um, of those many uh, souls and stomachs that were fed today um, in Denton and want to give a huge shout out to the Sunday school uh, class uh, led by the Tatum family to provide that hot meal this morning. Thank you uh, for those who offered that. And we also want to invite you to participate in the many missions that we have going on, the majority of which are in-kind donations. And there is a list that was sent out yesterday through an email that we want to invite you to participate in. And particularly a Zoom call that is going on today at 2 p.m. We are aware that the County of Dallas has issued a mandatory face mask and believe that Denton County is coming soon. And so we want to provide face masks for all of those who may not have the capability to either make those or have um, the capability to get those. And so we have a wonderful team of seamstresses who is going to be teaching us how to do that. So if you have a sewing machine, maybe a beginner sewer like me or in even just a needle and thread, we want to invite you to participate in that Zoom call today, uh, which again is on the email listed yesterday or you can call the church office for details on that call today at two o'clock. We also want to invite you to participate in a survey that's going on. Uh, details of that have been going out all week long through our emails. And uh, the reason we're doing this is because post-Easter and knowing that we might be in this for a longer haul, we want to make sure that we are listening to your concerns and meet you right where you're at with the programming that we can provide for you through this ministry that will feed your soul and nourish your spirit uh, during this uncertain times so that we can be people of faith in the certainty of God's presence with us. And so will you offer yourself in that way to us this week? As we enter into our time of offering our financial gifts, so we want to invite you to give online, of course, encouraging you to uh, give through ACH, uh, through our online debit program. As we listen to this hymn of promise, reminding us of the new hope of the resurrection Every day, let us profess our testimony to it as we give to the missions and ministries of the church and beyond. Thank you for worshiping today to give yourself the Sabbath rest of what it means to give praise and thanks to God for every moment of this new hope and this new life of resurrection. 
And so may you receive this benediction, going forth from this place, believing with all assurance that God knows your name. As a disciple of Christ, may you be faithful to that by professing the grace and the goodness of God in all you say and in all you do. In the name of Christ, may you know that you are held in the promise and the love of God as God holds us on eagle's wings. <laughs>